This is the lecture for uh, Thomas Nagel's The Absurd. And so there's only one thing to talk about in this lecture, and it's sort of a reminder about how to read philosophy and a refresher about how to read philosophy. So let's sort of start reading through this article. He says, most people feel on occasion that life is absurd, and some feel it vividly and continually. Yet the reasons usually offered in defense of this conviction are patently inadequate. They could not really explain why life is absurd. Why then do they provide a natural expression for the sense that it is? So, you know, you read this and the thought should be, there's basically three ideas here. Number one, there's this sense that life is absurd. So that's sort of idea number one. Number two, Nagel doesn't think that uh, there are really any reasons for thinking life is absurd, or that at least the typical reasons don't work. So he's ar going to argue against reasons for thinking that life is absurd. And then he's going to sort of ask, why do these reasons seem to sort of explain how life is absurd? So he's going to try to figure out what's going on here. So when you read these first three sentences, you should have sort of a bit of a map of the article or a part of the article built out already. So you're ready for what's coming. You're looking for three things. Maybe you're looking for the first, what is it to think life is absurd? You're looking for the second, what are the usual reasons offered in defense of it? And why doesn't he think these reasons work? And then you're looking for the third, which is an answer to this question. So uh, you want to sort of have that in your mind as you begin, and hopefully you're already assembling that when you read something like this. But then let's look at sort of the first uh, paragraph in section one, or the first two. So he says, consider some examples. So you want to be thinking to yourself, examples of what exactly? And the answer is back up here, so examples. It's often remarked that nothing we do now will matter in a million years. But if that is true, then by the same token, nothing that will be the case in a million years matters now. In particular, it does not matter now that in a million years, nothing we do now will matter. Moreover, even if what we did now were going to matter in a million years, how could that keep our present concerns from being absurd? If their mattering now is not enough to accomplish this, how would it help if they mattered a million years from now? Whether what we do now will matter in a million years could make the crucial difference only if it's mattering in a million years depended on its mattering period. So I think, especially if you're not very used to reading philosophy yet, and you know you haven't had lots of practice, uh, a normal person looks at this and they say, why, why Nagel, are you writing like this? Why do you keep repeating sort of matter in a million years? Like this is an extremely repetitive way of writing. It's also an extremely confusing way of writing because uh, he sort of like take, moreover, even if what we did now were going to matter in a million years, how could that keep our present concerns from being absurd? If mattering now is not enough to accomplish this, how would it help if they mattered a million years from now? And so it's sort of like, presenting the same idea in uh, a bunch of times over and saying like, it does matter or it doesn't matter, or if it did matter, what would this lead to? And so the thought is just, uh, look, you have to take sentences like this slow. The reason that he keeps repeating phrases like matter in a million years or uh, a million years from now, or uh, it could not matter or something like this, is that when we write normally in English, we often try to replace long phrases like this with words like it, or that, or this. But this uh, makes it hard to sort of track what exactly, which ideas exactly we're talking about. And this is because words like it, or that, or this, are really unspecific in English. They don't refer to anything in particular, they just refer to sort of something that came before. And you've probably noticed in your writing your papers, uh, I've been giving you lots of comments when you've used words like it, or this, or that, to refer to things, and I usually say something like, it's not really clear what this word is referring to, uh, or it's not obvious what this word is referring to. And that's because it's hard to make it obvious uh, what they're referring to. So if we look at this sentence, it's often remarked that nothing we do now will matter in a million years. But if that is true, and so this, that, it's pretty clear what that refers to. It's referring to uh, the fact that nothing we do now will matter in a million years. But if this previous sentence had been much longer, if this sentence uh, or something like, well, I don't know, uh, uh, if what we were doing now were going to matter in a million years, how could that keep our present concerns from being absurd, or something like that? Then if he followed it up with a sentence saying, if that were true, then you'd be asking, well, is that this part, or is it this part, 
or is it both parts put together or something? So the reason he's writing in this sort of repetitive style and the reason I'm often encouraging you to write in this repetitive style is that although initially it makes it seem like it's harder to read, you go through a paragraph like this and you're like, oh, it's, it's just sort of word salad or something. I'm not, it's very hard to get a grasp on what's going on. In fact, if you go through slowly and you sort of take each sentence as it comes and try to understand each sentence in its own context, it's actually much easier to understand than if you were just using words like this and that to refer to earlier things, because that's a more vague way of writing. And because he's writing in this more precise way, because he's being clear about each idea and using sort of the whole phrase matter in a million years or something whenever he refers to it, this means, uh, number one, you can figure out exactly what he's trying to say if you give it enough time. And number two, if you want, you can start start to construct like a map or you can start to simplify things in your mind. So you could turn uh, in a million years, nothing will matter or nothing matters now or something like this. Uh, you can turn one of those into X and then you can start rewriting the sentence. So in particular, it does not matter now that in a million years, nothing we do will matter. So you could turn in a million years, nothing we do now will matter to X. So that would say in particular, it doesn't matter now that X and so you can start to sort of like try to recreate the argument using just variables or something, and that can help you understand the form of the argument and not get caught up in the content, which is uh, understanding, you know, a million years from now, like that phrase or something. And so uh, this is just, again, like a reminder of how to read uh, philosophy and pointing out this sort of extra tip, which is when somebody's repeating something, repeating some idea or multiple ideas, so mattering a million years from now and mattering right now, you can sort of take those ideas and put them on one side and then just try to get the structure of the argument if you'd like. And so that's the case here, and uh, there's some other complicated paragraphs in here, like um, this first paragraph here in section four can be a little tough, but um, you know, just use the reading skills that you've developed go slowly and maybe go back and look at the how to read philosophy lecture if you need uh, another refreshing course on that.